Good evening and welcome. Great to see everyone here tonight, Emmanuel Baptist Church. Welcome those who are watching us on Facebook Live. We've got an exciting night. Got a guest speaker. I'm not going to ruin the surprise. Not going to ruin the surprise. Let Brother Brian introduce him a little bit. Great to have our youth in here. They've brought the age from our group down tremendously. Thank you, youth. We're going to sing some songs you've never heard before, but just mouth the words. We'll be done in just a minute. Silver Saints, every Tuesday. Let me tell you how you can help. That's every Tuesday at 10 o'clock. Our senior adults get together. They go visit those who are shut in or maybe at uh, hospitals or nursing homes. They can't get out. Here's how you can help. If you've got old vases at your house, Bud vases. So if, you're, uh, if your spouse brought you a bunch of roses, <laughs> roses have died, bring the vase. We need vases to help put flowers. We take flowers, cakes, and all kind of things. Uh, Miss Edna Matthews, Miss Ivy, Al Wills, uh, a bunch of people involved. Bring those on. Uh, you can bring them Sunday or bring them anytime to us. Bring them to me. I'll make sure the right people get them. Uh, but we, we thank all those who go out and visit on our Tuesday morning Silver Saints. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And we'll begin our service. Dear Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to come, Father, to worship you through song and through our message, Father. Be with us as we uh, continue to praise you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand up. It says it in this song. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Let's all stand and sing. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Us, ye soldiers of the cross, lift high the royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead, till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord in Trumpet call obey Forth to the mighty conflict In this his glorious day Ye that are men now serve him Against unnumbered foes Let courage rise with danger And strength to strength oppose Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor's song. To those who overcome it, a crown of life shall be. this next song. It's the chorus of a praise song called Bow the Knee. I love this part where it says, when you don't understand the purpose, purpose of his plan, bow the knee. Let's sing. Here we go. Bow the knee. Trust the heart of your father when the answer goes beyond what you can see. Bow the knee. Lift your eyes toward heaven and believe the one who holds eternity. Here we go. When you don't understand the purpose of his plan, in the presence of your king, bow the knee. Bow the knee, trust the heart of your Father when the answer goes beyond what you can see. Bow the knee, lift your eyes toward heaven and believe the one who holds eternity. And when you Let's 
sing in the presence. In the presence of your King, bow the knee. It's always good to see everyone this evening. Uh, now, this evening, we have a guest speaker, Evan Smart. Evan is a young man who's a small group teacher, but Evan and his wife, Cassie, surrendered to vocational ministry last year, as well as Jeremiah and Lindsay, and we've already heard Jeremiah speak one time. And you know, as a home church, we want to be giving young men opportunities to grow in their, uh, in their ability, but also in their calling. And so this evening, I've asked Evan to come, and we want to come, and we want to encourage him. Come on, Evan. And I'm going to pray over him, and then I'm going to turn everything over to him. Now, Evan, this is your 1800th time to preach, right? Now, that's just this message. He's not done it publicly yet, but privately, Cassie knows all about it. She's, she's memorized it. I remember doing that. Evan, I shared my first time I ever preached. I preached two hours, but... Uh, you're not going to be that long tonight, right? No, I promise. That's good. <laughs> All right. Listen, would you join me? we we'll go to the Lord in prayer, and we ask the Lord to bless this time. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' precious name, we pray that you'd receive glory. Father, you're worthy, and we honor your name. God, I pray you'd anoint this young man tonight to preach the wonderful and precious name of Jesus. And I pray, God, that you'd use him, his wife, their family in mighty and great ways for your kingdom's sake. And, Lord, we look forward to seeing what you're going to do in and through their life and ministry together. Thank you for allowing Emmanuel Baptist Church to partner with this family. And, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name your kingdom would be expanded and name made great through the faithfulness of your servants. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, church family. Well, my name is Evan Smart. Uh, I am a small group teacher here. I'm over in 106. We teach young adults. If you graduate out of Danny's college class, I'm typically going to try to poach you and pull you in. My wife's Cassie. Uh, we have a beautiful little girl. Uh, her name is Eliana. She's over in the children's wing right now. If you would hear me, I would love to pray one more time before uh, this sermon begins. If you would just bow your heads with me, I'd really appreciate that. Lord, God, give me the strength to surrender this sermon over to you. God, just allow me to preach your word. Give me the strength and wisdom to speak to these people and allow anything that's a part of me to be removed from this. Allow it to only bring you glory. In your precious son's name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. I'm going to pull my notes up here. I know that I'm super high tech. I've got a cool iPad that I might use for my notes. But tonight... I would really like us to focus on this sentence, preparing the way. If you would, I'm going to pull up Isaiah chapter 40, and I would ask you to stand with me for the reading of God's word when you have your Bibles ready. Starting in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. Look at that. My youth were quick on the draw. Jonathan has got them trained. They knew exactly where to go. I love it. Verse 3, a voice cries, In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Thank you. You may be seated. Appreciate you. All right. <clears throat> this Bible that I'm holding in my hands is a very special Bible to me. It was with me in my time of recruit training uh, on Paris Island. It's not a very big Bible. It's very small. It says Military Challenge Edition. Someone was kind enough to give me this. 
If you don't know, we typically get those tiny little Gideons, and it's only the New Testament, but someone was very kind and handed me this very large one that I could get the Old Testament as well. And throughout my time as a young adult, I was being prepared for things that I didn't know were coming. At the same time, I was also preparing all the while. And I said that this was my very first sermon, and in truth it really is, to stand here in front of you all. However, there was a day, and I'm just going to tell a quick story. Does anybody know what a, a foot locker is? Your military, there we go, I got a few hands back there. Okay, so a foot locker, for those of you that don't know, maybe your father brought one home, or maybe you had one up in an attic somewhere, but it's a very large box. It's just about three feet, maybe a foot and a half, two feet deep. And one day on Sunday, our drill instructor came in, he went into his hut, and he was supposed to tell us to go to church, because that's what you did. You could either go to church or you could stay behind alone and deal with his wrath. So you typically went to church. However, unfortunately, this man came in, went into his hut, and as far as I know, he fell asleep, and he didn't send us anywhere. So we sat out there not knowing what to do, and if you're a good little recruit, You sit still until you're told what to do. And he he came out about two hours after we were all supposed to go to church. And he came to me. I was the Protestant lay reader. We had a Catholic and a Protestant lay reader. And he said, this is the first time I've ever heard a drill instructor say this. He said, I'm so sorry. Please don't tell anyone. He was the, the little drill instructor. You got three levels. Please don't tell anyone. If you want to, you can go in the back and you can read your Bible or something. He didn't care. He just didn't want to get in trouble. But I grabbed one of those foot lockers and I turned it upright. And I had my three foot little pedestal and I opened the book and we read uh, the Bible throughout this uh, about an hour and a half. We sat there and read the Bible to each other. We didn't quite know what we were doing. I had never prepared a sermon before in my entire life. But man, I'm telling you, I was being prepared even in that time. So, how do we prepare the way? There's three things I'd love us to focus on tonight. And the first one is, if we open back up into Isaiah 40, we will see a voice cries. This is the voice crying out in the wilderness. Now, we can actually find where this uh, prophecy is first fulfilled if we turn over a little bit into Matthew chapter 3. Now, the context here in Isaiah 40, Isaiah is writing to a Uh, captive Israelite nation that is uh, in Babylon and and the Assyrian Empire has got them uh, uh, um, under control and he's writing to them through a message of hope and deliverance uh, and we see this prophecy fulfilled over in Matthew 3. So let's take a look at the initial fulfillment of this prophecy several hundred years after the fact. Matthew chapter 3 beginning in 1 verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, verse 3 is, we'll focus on this real quick. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. There we go. We've got our confirmation right there. A voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. Now, here in Matthew's gospel, we are introduced to the man. And I'm sure you've got someone in the Bible apart from Jesus being our favorite, that you just look to and you're like, man, that guy, I just, I love his story. I love uh, the, the, the ups and the downs and the highs and the lows. Uh, for me personally, John the Baptist is, is one of my favorite characters in the Bible, one of my favorite men that we see written about. We don't have a whole lot about uh, John the Baptist. However, we know from reading further on in Matthew that he was a raggedy man. He wore camel hair, a leather belt, and he ate locusts and wild honey. Has anyone ever been around a camel, not at a fair, a a real camel, a live camel? I'll remember uh, uh, one more story, I promise. I remember uh, on deployment, we would sit at this little um, bus stop. We had to wait. We had to wait at an airfield, and we'd get bussed all the way over to where we would sleep. And occasionally, we would look out, and I'm talking probably a quarter to a half a mile, maybe more, we would see Bedouins crossing over uh, a camel herders with about 15 or 20 camels. And even at that distance, even with the wind not coming in, you can, you can smell those camels. They are, they are a pungent, pungent smell. 
So this is a man who knew true wilderness. He likely lived a hard life. But he cried out. And when we cry out, we are to preach the truth. Now, I want to talk about two things here. How do we cry out? How do we cry out like John the Baptist? In Isaiah's prophecy, we notice a couple things first. We see the words crying. You may have a version that says calling. But here in Matthew, at the fulfillment of this prophecy that we've just covered, we actually see a, a very key word that we should catch, and it's preach. John the Baptist preached in the wilderness. Now, is this a contradiction or a misstep on Matthew's part to attribute the prophecy to John the Baptist? Not at all. Not at all. See, in the original Hebrew, Isaiah is not simply saying crying or calling. He is saying proclaiming. It's got a little bit more meaning to it because the voice of one crying out is crying out with purpose. He is proclaiming with a specific and pointed cause. John was preaching in the wilderness boldly and confidently about the truth. I want to turn to, just bear with me here, we're going to turn over to Acts 4, verse 13, and I just want to share this verse with you to add to our point here. This is a time when Peter and John are speaking to the elders, they're speaking to the leaders in Jerusalem. And after they got done speaking, verse 13 says, Now, when they, the onlookers, saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. When we cry out and preach in the wilderness, we are to do so with boldness. I really want to break this verse down. This has got to be one of my favorite verses. Um, really quickly, when it says they saw they were uneducated and common men, they weren't necessarily calling John and Peter stupid. However, what they mean here is they could perceive these men were not men of status. They weren't men with higher educations as the Pharisees. Uh, they weren't dressed in a way that showed they had some sort of high lineage or anything like that. They were common fishermen. But what did they see? They saw the boldness in their words. <clears throat> If you notice at the end of that verse, it says, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. So if we break that verse down, we can track it all the way back to the boldness of what they were saying. We're going to get to a little bit more here about speaking this truth about Jesus, but I, I cannot skip over this. If we are struggling when we share our faith, if we find it hard, if we feel nervous, if we feel that we just can't quite, I just don't know the words, I'm not sure, I'm not quite sure, how do I share with that person or this, that man or that woman? Friends, if we're struggling to cry out boldly about Jesus, I believe Scripture tells us we need to be spending more time with Him. Now, the wilderness that John preached in was a physical location. It was around the River Jordan, likely near Jericho, uh, and every person that was traveling from the northern region of Israel would likely travel down this road next to the River Jordan. If you'll remember in your minds, you might see the map of Israel, and you've got Samaria. We don't cross through Samaria. We go around down the River Jordan and then cross back over to Jerusalem. So he's preaching boldly to quite a lot of people on this road, and he is preparing the way of the Lord by preaching the good news boldly. Point number two here, really quickly about crying out. With who do we cry out? I'm going to read from uh, 1 Thessalonians. This is chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. You yourselves know, brothers, that our visit to you was not in vain. As you are aware, we had already endured suffering and shameful treatment in Philippi. But in the face of strong opposition, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God 
I'm worried about how I'll be treated if I speak boldly to this person. Uh, the youth is going to remember this story, I'm sure of it, I'm sure of it, from D now. Uh, I really want to share this. I think it was an extremely impactful story. Um, there was a missionary there who had spent 10 years in Afghanistan, and he actually came home with his wife and young boys in 2021. You may or may not remember what happened in 2021. There was a mass, chaotic, somewhat, someone might say chaotic, pullout of our troops in Afghanistan in 2021. Now, the man had been there for 10 years. And one day, towards the end of this visit, this, this missionary trip, uh, his wife looked over to him. Do you guys remember this? His wife looks over to him and says, I want some ice cream. And gentlemen, what do we do when our wife says we want ice cream? We go get ice cream, right? We go, to, we go get ice cream. They don't have a freezer or a, a fridge. They barely got electricity, so there's no keeping ice cream in there. However, the man gets in his car, drives down to the plaza, and he, I'm, I'm sure he had seen this ice cream store a million times. Um, I'm assuming it was the first time he'd been in there. Goes inside and meets the man, uh, the gentleman behind the counter, and says, ice cream. As a good missionary, he starts learning about the man, getting to know him, getting to know his name, learning, uh, learning a little bit about his life, and then he begins to share the gospel of Jesus. He begins to talk about Jesus. And what he said was, um, I looked over to the right, and I saw this railing. I'd never been in here before, but I saw this railing. And I got my ice cream, and I was all ready to go, and he he walked over and kind of looked down, and apparently there was a whole cafe just below him of silent men, about 12, maybe 20 people down there. He had, no, he had no idea we're there. No idea. He had just gotten done preaching, basically preaching to this man, sharing the gospel, and he looked down, and oh man, he said, you don't, you don't share all the time in Afghanistan until you quite get to know that person. And so what he did is he goes home. They're on the plane ride. The pullout happens. Everything goes chaotic. They've got to leave. And on the plane ride home, he said he looked over at his wife, and his only regret that he had, he said, I wish I had been more bold when I talked to that man. Maybe those down in the cafe would have heard him. Romans 10, verse 17 says, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Friends, John isn't here anymore. Our friendly Camel-wearing wild man uh, is gone. He, there is no man eating locusts and, and, and honey out near the Jordan River. It's up to us to prepare the way of the Lord and to cry out in the wilderness boldly to all those that can hear. Point number two. We are moving past the crying out. I really want to focus on something here that John says. These are the first words that we even get from John the Baptist. Point number one, outwardly. Point number two, inwardly. What does John the Baptist say? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. How does repentance prepare the way of the Lord? Acts chapter 2, verse 37 and 38. These are the apostles preaching to the people. Verse 37, when people heard, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they asked Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? What a good question, by the way. What shall we do? Verse 38, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what is repentance? 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation, whereas worldly grief produces death. Not a fun road to walk down in that direction. Simply put, repentance is the true heartfelt sorrow that we feel because of our sin. It is a renouncing of that sin and a sincere commitment to forsake that sin and walk in obedience through Christ. Worldly grief, as I said, is a dangerous, dangerous game. Clinging to the sin that separates us from our Heavenly Father is always going to be a dangerous road. There's a reason why John opens his bold preaching with repent. 
Because the truth is, when we remove repentance from the gospel, it is no longer the gospel. Many of you may know, and bless you if you just didn't see it, the Super Bowl. We had a super great ad that played during the Super Bowl. The title of the company is called He Gets Us. The issue with this ad is that it played several pictures of certain people washing other people's feet, which is great. We wash feet of those that come to repentance in the Lord. The problem with the ad, however, is it never once mentions repentance for our sins. It barely mentions Jesus. When we decide to remove these this concept and this word of repentance from when we cry out boldly, we're essentially removing Jesus. <clears throat> Just as John called the Jews to repentance to, repair, to prepare for Jesus' coming, we are also called to a repentance that is sincere, that is rooted in godly grief, This kind of repentance clears the path. It prepares us to know Jesus. It prepares us to be in a relationship with Jesus. Jesus himself in the very next chapter, the one we are reading right now, Matthew 4, after his time in the wilderness, his 40 days and 40 nights, he begins his preaching. Verse 17 of chapter 4. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus himself begins his own preaching. By saying repent. But how do I know this? How do I know that I'm repenting? The evidence of this preparatory work of repentance is in a few things. One, go back to godly grief. It's your guilt. It's the shame that you feel when you have sinned against our Father, our Heavenly Father. The issue with today is that Satan and the enemy has decided he's not going to attack the things he attacked the past. He's going to attack that word, that word guilt. We have turned this word into such a taboo word, a word that cannot be said. It's, it's, un, it's unutterable. Oh, don't you feel guilty? <gasps> can't say that. can't say guilt. Absolutely not. Friends, I'm here to tell you that this is an attack from the enemy. Our guilt, the godly grief that we feel when we sin, is a good thing. It is okay to feel this. Repent and ask for forgiveness. Don't allow the enemy and the world to shape your definition of guilt and shame. Repent. Allow the Holy Spirit to convict you through that guilt and shame. We cannot allow Satan to change this word on us. But I've repented and I'm just, I'm just not sure. Repentance without change, it just simply isn't true Repentance. Scripture tells us that there simply should be changes. There should be changes in behavior. There should be changes in our attitudes. We ought to bear fruit through repentance. Take a look further down in Matthew 3. Verse 8 says, Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. We are to turn from this sin and bear fruits through our repentance. And this preparing for the Lord is furthered and continues when we bear these fruits through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I believe these fruits are further explained by Paul in his letter to the Galatians, being Galatians 5, verse 22, the fruits of the Spirit. And I want to encourage you to persist in repentance and to prepare in repentance, maintaining a repentant heart and staying on that path of righteousness. We're going to move on to point number three. Preparing in the mountains and the valleys. We'll go all the way back to where we started in Isaiah 40. Starting at verse 4, Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground, the uneven ground and the rough places made a plain. (laughs) What are these mountains and valleys? Well, I believe in the literal sense There will be a day, as told in Revelation, where there will be a great leveling. 
this world will receive and, and, and experience a great level, a great and awesome level. The question I would ask you, though, are what are the dangers of these valleys and mountains and rough places? They pose no threat to Jesus. Our Savior conquered the grave. A valley and a mountain pose no threat to him. That can't stop him. In Matthew 4, verse 4, then Jesus was led up by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I sure would be too. In verse 3, and the tempter came to him and said, if you are the Son of God, command these stones become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You see, I want to walk you through a few things here. The mountains that we experience today are mountains of pride, mountains of materialism, materialistic attitudes, mountains of greed, mountains of lust, these mountains that we have built up in our own lives. Matthew 16, 24 through 26. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? The mountains that we are on top of, the mountains that we've built ourselves, Satan will find us on these mountains. Take an example straight from Scripture. Satan led Jesus to a mountain. And what did he tell him to do on top of the mountain? He says, look out, I can give you everything. I can give you all of this. You've already got so much. You have built this life up for yourself. You have hoarded this wealth. You have, built, you have, have spent hours and hours at your job to get this promotion. You have, you, whatever crazy hobby it is that you are into, you have built this mountain. But look out just a little bit further, and I can give you all that too. You just stay on this mountain here with me, right here. Bow down and worship me, and I can give you all of this as well. But what about the valleys? Friends, we go through valleys of depression. We go through valleys of anxiety. We go through valleys of loneliness. But Jesus tells us, as we just read in Matthew 16, if you would lay down, if you would surrender, if you would give up your life for me, you would find it. Verse 28 says of Matthew 16, And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, this is Peter on the water. You've, you've heard this story several times. You have read it in Sunday school. You have um, probably heard several sermons about this. We have mountains, we have valleys, and we have rough places. Out on the Sea of Galilee, as the storm is brewing, and the wind is raging, and the waters are coming down. The rain is hitting the apostles' face. Uh, they can barely see. They can barely hear. And they see something off quite a ways in the distance. They can't quite make it out. But Peter stands up and says, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, Lord, save me. 31, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took him, saying to you, O ye of little faith, why did you doubt? When we're on top of these mountains of pride and materialism, or when we're in these valleys of depression and loneliness and sadness, and we just don't know how to get up, we can't quite stand up, when we're in these uneven places, this uneven ground, when the wind is smacking us in the face and we can barely make out 10 feet in front of us, Jesus is still inviting us to come. 
Jesus is still saying, come to me. (laughs) Friends, if we would just put our faith in him and put our trust in him. His hand is outstretched wide. His hand is ready to take us out of the valley. His hand is ready to lead us down off of this mountain of pride. His hand is ready to save us when we're just about to sink. Jesus will guide us through each and every topography of life if we would just put our faith in him. I want to end with this. I scroll down a little bit here. I, I'm, I'm in, still in Isaiah 40, but down in verse 5, it says, And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. We're going to go a little further. We're going to read 6, 7, and 8. Verse 6 says, A voice says, Cry. And I said, What shall I cry? All, for, all flesh is like grass. And its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are the grass. Verse 8 says, The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. We are to prepare the way of the Lord. We are to prepare through crying out, through crying out boldly, through preaching the truth, prepare the way by preaching repentance. We are to prepare even on the mountains. We are to prepare even in the valleys, even in the rough places for the Lord our God. I'm going to invite the band up to the stage, and we'll end here. Friends, I want to leave you with just a little bit more. If you've put your trust in Jesus, if he is your Savior, Master, and King, and if you have repented of your sins, you've confessed he is your King, then bless you. However, tonight I I just want to end on this one question. We're going to have a time of invitation here in a minute, but I have to ask, If you haven't begun to prepare for the Lord, then what are you preparing for? I'm going to ask everyone if we could bow our heads without looking around and go into a time of prayer. Lord, We come to you tonight knowing that without you, God, we are lost. Lord, without you, we will see failure. Lord, without you, we don't have life. But God, we know that through you, through your son, Jesus, his shed blood, We know that we are victorious. We will have eternal life. We will spend it with you. Lord, we ask that you would give us the strength and the wisdom to prepare the way of the Lord for you. Lord, give us the strength to cry out boldly to the onlookers in the spiritual wilderness of Tallahassee, the spiritual wilderness of this world. Lord, give us the wisdom to tell them to repent. Lord, give us the wisdom to speak your truth, your scripture, your word to them. God, we love you and we worship you. Lord, you are our heavenly father. You are the creator of this universe. In your, in your son's precious name, amen. Let's stand for a hymn of invitation. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, a place where sin cannot molest, near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, bless, redeemer. 
Evan, thank you so much. Evan, I'm going to give these back to you, though. You might want to take these home, okay? Thank you, brother. Look forward to seeing what God does in your ministry and life. So thankful for you and your wife and your family. All right, at this time, what we're going to do, we're going to enter into our time of normal business, and then our normal business meeting last in we're from about five to seven minutes. So just hang on for a minute, okay? And then we're going to go into an entire time of prayer, have some prayer needs, want to update you on, and then we'll be dismissed for this evening. Do I have a motion to go into business meeting this evening? There's a first, there's a second. All right, thank you.
A Tennessee boy would say Woongji and Inju Chun. And they live in Duluth, Georgia, of all places now. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Nearly a third of all Koreans in Georgia live in Gwinnett County. More than 100,000 first and second generation Koreans live in the county. Did you hear that? Over 100,000 Koreans live in Georgia. That's incredible. It is the leading Korean, they, uh, leading, they have many Korean themed restaurants, retail shops, and markets to become a very prominent aspect of the community. To engage these individuals, these Koreans, with the good news, Woonji leads an evangelism team to the Korean market every Tuesday and Thursday. Many young Koreans hear and respond to the gospel each week during these efforts. I am personally very thankful for these individuals and their heart for Jesus Christ to be shared to the ends of the earth. But I'll tell you something. I've shared this with many people who live here. Look, our hearts to reach the nations. And I tell you what, the nations have come to Tallahassee. They go right down the street here to Florida State University, to Florida A&M, to TCC. And you just heard that, 100,000 Koreans living in Gwinnett County, Georgia. That, that, that blows my mind. I had no idea. No idea. But let me tell you something, folks. Where people are, that's where we need to be with the gospel. No matter what you look like, no matter what you sound like, no matter where you've come from, we need to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ in a way they can understand in a way they can respond to Christ. Several prayer needs this evening. Misty Townsend, I need to continue praying for her. She has treatment for some kidney issues. Lucas Burns, I believe is home. Lucas, son of Joe Burns. Joe sits right back there on Sunday mornings, he and his wife and their family. Uh, Joe, Lucas was in the hospital last week. Please be in prayer for, continue to be in prayer for him. Pat Searles, Miss Katie Crowder. Also be in sympathy to Nicole Riles. This is J.D., uh, JD's over our facilities here. I believe they are gone now to the uh, to the surge or to the service of uh, of Miss Nicole's uh, family loss of her aunt, Miss Betty Hasley. Uh, continue to remember Miss Joy Landon, Tracy's mom. I do want us to also remember those who were affected at the Super, Super Bowl shooting uh, celebration for the Chiefs last week. If you if you followed the news at all, you heard about that and just terrible tragedy. Uh, please be in prayer for those who are affected, even those who are involved in the shooting itself. Uh, Margaret McKay, a friend of Miss Jessica Colden, will be in prayer for her. Also, John Strickland, a friend of Miss Jessica Golden. And then Thomas Blaylock, a friend of our family, uh, more or less family. Now, some of you may have heard last night, uh, Emmy, another individual from our church, also were involved in a car collision. Uh, everybody's okay. We certainly praise God for that. But let me just stop and say for a moment, We've had a lot in our church family the last couple of months in accidents. And you don't ever know when the last time you're ever going to see the person who's sitting next to you is going to be. Did you know that? Don't ever take life for granted, friend. Don't take life for granted. There have been a lot of people who have gone to the store for a carton of milk, and they've never come home. Love your family. Love your friends. Jesus says love your enemies. As a church family, Emmanuel Baptist Church wants to be salt and light. It's interesting, as I was talking to the officer right over here, the, the wreck took place right here. As I was talking to this officer last night, she said, my husband and I are looking for church home. And I turned her around and I said, ma'am, there's a new church home right there, Emmanuel Baptist Church. And she said, Everybody here knows one another. I said, yes, ma'am, we do. And we love one another, too, on top of that. And we do. Love your family. Tell people about Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for the gift of eternal life in Christ. I'm thankful for the wonderful family, Lord, in Jew, the Chuns, who are ministering to people in Koreans in, uh, in Gwinnett County. I pray, God, that you would bless the work of their hands, and I pray, Father, that your kingdom would expand in that area, and many, many, many individuals would say yes to Jesus and be born again and saved. Father, we thank you for those who have recently been born again and saved here, not even within the walls of this church family. Lord, I pray that you would continue to bring a great harvest, and Lord, may we be a part of that in our day. 
Lord, not just sitting on our hands, but God, getting out on our feet, being faithful with our mouths, and Lord, weeping with our lives. And I pray, God, that we would reach people where they are. Lord, I pray for every name we've mentioned this evening. God, heal as only you can as Jehovah Rophe. We trust you. We know that you love your children. And God, ultimately, you want people who don't know you to be saved. So, Father, whatever it takes, I pray that we'd be faithful. We thank you for the gift of life. And I thank you, Father, for each and every day that we're able to wake up. May we not take those days for granted. May we not say, oh, I don't have anything to do today. I'm just bored out of my mind. Father, what a selfish thing to say. Because the truth is, if you're, we're your child, God, you've given every single one of us a purpose. Not to sit at home bored, but God, to live on mission with vision from you. And I pray that we would do that faithfully until Jesus returns. In the precious name of the Lamb of God, we pray. Amen. I love you. Find someone this week. Bring them with you to Manual Baptist Church this Sunday. Have a blessed week.